Um, unfortunately, um, I'm going to be really quick about this, um, which saddens me because we should be developing this sort of more through discussion, but I'd forgotten that um, we hadn't finished um, that we hadn't finished this lecture. Um, so for the example of the yeoman and Yankee farmers, the origin of the difference was um, the geography of where they came from, basically cultural differences that they started with from where they were, um, from where they, where they came from, which might have been shaped by environmental conditions in like Germany and versus sorry, England and Scotland. Um, but, um, but interestingly, both the, um, the yeoman, the sort of German origin and Yankee um, farmers lived in the same environment and foraged in the same way. So I'm going to sort of write these out. Um, Um, so environmental variation, maybe in original um, source countries, but not in Illinois, right? Um, they farm the same land or the same crops using similar technology, right? What's different is um, whether they, um, their willingness to rent out their land or to rent land um, to farm more versus sticking with what they're able to own. Um, and they're willing, the motivation to like sell um, the farms when um, farming is in some decline rather than passing it on to their children. And that leads also to differences in how they teach children, what kind of schools, um, uh, church attendance, stuff like that. Genetic variation, um, I'll just say no. Um, uh, similarly to, and, and that's actually very similar to um, the Newer and the Dinka example. Um, the origin of the difference well one tribe probably used to be um you know the 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 newer were i think an offshoot of um the dinka um and they lived and grazed in the same environment um and there was no genetic variation between them either so the phenotypes for the yeoman and yankee farmers were um uh basically like what I just said in the in the previous slide, um, whether they um, whether they were willing to rent out or sell their own land, whether they um, rented um, land to farm, um, the kinds of churches that they attended, and um, the schools that they sent their their kids to. Um, and Primary also um, the cultural values of basically staying on the farm um, versus seeking out opportunities um, wherever they might be presented. Um, so the phenotypes are willingness to rent land um, and sell land um, versus owning and passing on to children, um, values of um, continuing to farm versus um, per pursuing, you know, new opportunities. Um, and then there were differences in in schooling and church, um, what churches they went to and, and church attendance. Um, so in this case, um, the question is whether biased transmission 
um, which is sort of similarly a little bit um, more like Dawkins means or other modes of transmission are important in this system. And um, this is a case where with the Yeoman and Yankee farmers, it actually, you know, vertical transmission seems more important. Um, however, size of the community um, is more a function of um, phylopatry versus dispersal. Basically, whether people leave the towns um, than what we would think of as like, you know, fitness and family size and stuff. Um, then survival and reproduction. Okay. Um, so this is interesting. Is, is cultural evolution by natural selection important in this example? How does it work in kind of what I said before? Um, it's not so much like family size or survival to re reproduction and stuff or like avoiding predators, um, natural selection, but um, um, movement seems to be, you know, is really important. Like, you know, to what degree does your um, do children, um, you know, decide to settle near where they grew up um, and remain in those communities. So natural selection is important in this example. It's important to see how, in this case, it's not just survival and reproduction. Um, okay, so um, we were talking about um, the units of um, cultural selection. According to Dawkins, he's really excited about memes as like an analog or even a homolog to uh, an analog to genes. Um, although, aside from the fact that it's like a really catchy idea, like we all talk about memes now, even though most of us probably didn't think of Richard Dawkins when we've talked about memes like, you know, songs or TikToks or, you know, um, phrases that are especially catchy. Um, but, you know, Dawkins coined the term um, and he did it because he wanted something that rhymed with gene, right? Um, so it's like a memory gene. Um, and most of the examples of memes, most of what we think of are, you know, these sort of small units. Um, and however, you know, these smaller units can potentially be linked into larger functional units. Um, the thing is that like the, um, the similarity to genes is really only analogous and it's not a very good analogy. Um, in other words, um, it's not that memes in Dawkins idea are gonna lead to genetic change although we're going to see a whole bunch of examples of how culture leads to genetic evolution in humans and animals. Um, and then the other thing that's sort of weird is that the, the selection, there isn't like natural selection in the idea that like some memes lead to greater reproductive success and that's why they become more common. In Dawkins' view, memes are more like germs. They just travel epidemiologically um, from person to person. Um, so selection, as much as it happens, is just on the level of memes, right? So different ideas are sort of competing for our attention. Um, and that means that Dawkins is only thinking about or focused on biased transmission. Um, so the idea that ideas can travel from one to another and much less of any focus on whether different cultural practices lead to differential reproductive success or you know growth or decline of those communities. Um, so kind of like I said, selection is not dependent on reproductive success or survival, but only on our other people imitating those memes. Um, and that process ends up being somewhat like tautological, that means circular, um, which is an a, a objection that people have raised about natural selection. 
although um the like in natural selection there's actually a way to to think and understand how natural selection works that's not circular um it's just that what is evolving are the traits um and the traits um become more common not because by definition they're coming becoming more common, but because on average individuals that have those traits have more offspring um, or their offspring survive better, they have more grandchildren. Um, and that's how the traits become more common. In memes, it's it it is actually sort of much more circular. Um, and it and it actually it makes memes more similar to like parasites rather than genes right um and any belief any idea or belief could be called a parasitic meme um and so dawkins um you know singles out religious belief as a parasitic um as a par as a parasitic meme um probably because he doesn't want to sort of give um credit for any sort of adaptive um, functions of religious belief. But there are other evolutionary biologists who are a little bit less antagonistic. And um, one is David Sloan Wilson, who um, I'll be assigning a chapter of a little bit later. Sorry, I've got a couple books of his, but I can't reach them right now. Um, but he's actually like, really interested in the adaptive function of religious beliefs. That's not like a study of the truth value of specific beliefs, but of, you know, what are the benefits to individuals and communities and on what level um, might selection be operating to um, have favored um, belief systems, which is an interesting question. Um, so, there are a number of criticisms of the meme concept, mostly that um, it doesn't really get you that much anywhere in terms of either cultural evolution or natural selection. Um, so it it discounts the fitness costs and benefits of different cultural traits. Um, so if the only thing that's important for ideas to spread is their ability to spread, you don't have to break your teeth trying to figure out whether these ideas are functional or adaptive. Um, you just have to figure out what makes ideas catchy. What are we pre-wired to prefer? Um, and then the the other um, the other thing is that it 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 hasn't led to sort of interesting insights about um, cultural transmission. Um, in other words, ideas are different than genes. Genes are physical things, you know, little bits of DNA, they get passed on. They don't have to be expressed to be passed on, whereas um, culture does have to be expressed um, unless we can preserve it in, in books, which can kind of save things um, even when you're not actively doing them. Um, but the the mode of transmission is is important and um, doesn't really get studied, um, which is you know kind of why um, uh, which is kind of why um, like there isn't really much of a research field in memetics. There was there was a journal. The journal's closed down. Um, so I'm not totally sure. Okay, let's go. Um, the other, um, so in contrast to memes, genes are really well defined. Like we understand what they do. They code for proteins. They have a physical structure. They have a beginning and an end. They get passed on whether they're um, read or not. We understand a lot about how they get passed on. And we're learning much more this decade about how they are read and expressed, um, which ends up being as important as being passed on. Um, so you don't. But the, the important thing is that like um, natural selection doesn't require a cultural unit like a meme, right? Beliefs, um, knowledge, 
um, preferences, um, those can be sort of large overarching ideas or small specific skills. Um, and they don't have to act like genes for, um, for them to have fitness consequences for groups um, or individuals and be favored um, or not favored and passed on through cultural evolution. Um, so basically like memetics or memes are an attempt to like create a, a, an inheritance unit like a gene when there actually isn't the need for an inheritance unit um, for cultural beliefs, knowledge, um, preferences, attitudes um, to have beneficial or harmful fitness consequences. Um, okay, so I'm just going to leave us at that. Um, so if, um, so you don't need memes to have cultural evolution. Um, however, it's still really important to understand how, um, cultural knowledge, beliefs, practices, um, are passed on. Is it mostly vertical from parents to offspring or is it mostly horizontal or biased? Um, and that ends up being important because vertical transmission, if vertical transmission is the only way ideas are being passed on, if we really just learn stuff from our parents, then um, cultural evolution would act sort of just like genetic evolution and ideas would spread um, based on how much they contribute to like reproductive success. Um, if it's just biases if all transmission is sort of horizontal um then what we need to understand are just like what um what are the genetic predispositions to different beliefs um richardson boyd and richardson um are arguing in their book that vertical transmission is at least somewhat important and as they're gonna make in an argument that you're going to read later on if you haven't read the whole book yet, which most of us haven't. Um, there's the way that um, cultural learning operates, it's also in Henrik, um, the rules that we've started to talk about, um, uh, prestige bias, um, uh, you know, imitation, conformity bias, and um, punishment and enforcement of social norms um, will lead to traits being um, basically homogenized within groups that will then make groups more different from each other and um, will make group level selection much more important. So that's like one of the main take home messages of the course. You don't have to, it doesn't have to completely make sense now. Um, but in the se second half of the course, um, it had better make sense. We'll be coming back to that idea a lot. Um, okay, so this is kind of um, like just doing a little bit of a summary differences between um, cultural and genetic evolution um, that um, the source of variation in genetic evolution is, is random. In cultural evolution, um, it's sometimes it's you could think of it as random or luck, um, and then sometimes due to you know intelligence and like brilliant insight um, or both. That's that's where like new ideas come from. Um, the selection is um, in genetic evolution is. Um, non-intelligent and random it's just based on differences in reproductive success the average differences in reproductive success that individuals with or without a trait have um, in cultural evolution that could be important and like so you, you can see that in the newer and dinka example right where one where um a the way that they defined kinship and inheritance 
um, and family size led to incredibly important differences in ability to raise a large army, which then or um, which then led to you know significant consistent differences in um, uh, you know success in battle. But it wasn't an intentional like people's belief about um, uh, who are their family um, was not an intentional belief system that was designed in order to win wars. It basically that was a case of sort of of random selection. Um, in this case, um, the selective force being success in battle. Um, genetic evolution is you know, almost entirely vertical. Genes are passed from parents to offspring. Cultural evolution, it's both. Like we learn things from our parents, not what they tell us, but what we see them do. Um, and then in some ages, we try to do the opposite of what our parents do, but some stuff, you know, has been sort of baked into us in frustrating ways. Um, but horizontal transmission is obviously incredibly important and it's gonna vary in different cultures. Some cultures are going to enforce more vertical and others um, favor more horizontal or provide the opportunity for more horizontal transmission, which is really interesting. So genetic evolution is basically Darwinian as defined by random variation leading to differences in average reproductive success becoming more common. Cultural evolution is sort of by definition um, Lamarckian because cultural learning is an environmental um, trait. And so the beliefs that you acquire and develop over your lifetime will have a huge influence on what you pass on to both your children and to peers horizontally and, and um, you know, non-relatives. Cool. Okay. Um, so that catches us up with just the little sort of introduction to cultural evolution. And now we're going to go back to um, social learning. And um, so what we just actually it might be more useful to look at the, to um, go over, um, return to this slide, which was, you know, in connection to that pigeon experiment, there'll be more pigeon experiments, but we can now see like, you know, different kinds of social learning, some where you're just alerted that there's a resource and you have to work things out for yourself, blind imitation, um, observational learning where you learn not just what's a resource, but how to exploit it. Um, and there's a long history of studying social learning. Um, and a lot of social learning doesn't involve teaching, right? Remember, we haven't seen a lot of examples of teaching yet. We've seen the tandem running in ants, but there's a lot of learning that can go on um, just by being in a social context and having the opportunity to observe um, the behavior and the reproductive or, or mating success of other individuals. Um, and, um, and there you go. Um, so we're going to go over a bunch of different kinds of um, exp um, examples of learning that's influenced by um, observation of or interacting with other animals. Um, so one example of imitation of behavior, basically, is that in um, when you live in a group, you can see the foraging success of others in the group and you can imitate those choices. We're gonna see a bunch of examples, but this is Osprey. Um, and what, this, um, what these graphs are showing basically is that if um, no, um, you know, Osprey sometimes nest in sort of gregarious semi-colonies and um, um, if a bird returns with a fish, then everyone in the colony potentially knows that that bird has been successful and maybe and is likely to return to the same spot where they had success. And it might be good to follow them and go in the same direction. And so what the figure on the left is showing is that if a bird returns, an osprey returns with, um, without, if no osprey returns with food, then 
the directions of foraging trips afterwards is random. But if an osprey returns with, in this case, an alewife, that's a kind of fish, um, then the um, then um, basically all the other birds leave the colony in the same direction, um, which actually is an especially good strategy for alewives because alewives are um, uh, a gregarious fish, right? You know, like you know the joke, why why are fish so smart? Because they have schools. Anyway, alewives are you know um, uh, you know have large schools that they swim together with. Um, and when they had an opportunity to see a successful forager and go out in the direction where that forager came from, they were more likely, they, they it took them less time to catch a fish, right? So that's, that's what we're seeing here. Informed ospreys took, you know, usually less than 10 minutes to find a fish. Um, whereas the ones that didn't have an opportunity to see a successful forager, sometimes it took them an hour to find a fish. Cool. Um, so another kind of social learning is um, public information use, and, and um, which is, um, when individuals acquire information about the quality of an environmental resource like a food patch, breeding habitat, by attending to the relative success of others within the same environment. Um, so this has been studied by a number of behavioral ecologists, um, Bologna and Templeton, uh, uh, also uh, Verdanchin, uh, Lucalan Giraldu, uh, Jenny Templeton is now at Knox. Um, and in contrast to social learning where you're like observing them doing a behavior and then imitating that behavior or observing them feeding in a certain spot and feeding in that spot, um, uh, public information use, you get a general idea about good and bad habitat by observing the success and behavior of others. So we're going to see this in a couple um, a couple contexts. So one thing that's interesting is um, what this example is going to show is that you can learn from failure of others as well as from success. So starlings often are found in flocks and groups. Um, starlings foraging in groups can learn about patch quality from observing the success and failure of others. So in these trials, um, they'll set up arenas with seed hidden in sand. So the birds can't actually see the seeds, but they can see other birds looking, you know, pecking, ex searching through the, the sand, and they can see how often they're finding food. So they can get a measure of patch quality from the foraging success of others. And um, so this is, um, in this case, the, the, that's what this that's what this trial was showing. Um, in this case, N stands for um, negative or like no reward. Um, P stands for positive that um, they're seeing the birds succeed in getting a seed. And um, interestingly, um, they um, they have the highest foraging success. In other words, it takes the fewest number of trials for them to, you know, collect a, a given number of seeds when they observed the failures of other starlings. So they learned like which cups to avoid. Um, if every time they saw a starling, um, you know, investigate a cup, it got a seed, they didn't learn that much about what were the better and worse um, uh, patches to forage in. Interestingly, control and a mix of rewarding and non-rewarding outcomes for what they were observing um, were sort of intermediate. Um, so in this case, they were really learning what patches to avoid by observing lots of failure, which was kind of interesting. Um, 
another kind of um, public information use is called inadvertent social information. So in this case, um, this is when birds observe the breeding success of either birds in their own species or even another species and can use that breeding success um, to guide their own habitat choice. So this is a really cool, I mean, one thing um, that you'll learn is we know a lot about birds that breed in nest boxes, right? So that's why we know so much about gray tits and blue tits um, and kestrels, European kestrels, because they nest in boxes and pied flycatchers. We know a ton about pied flycatchers um, because you can put out a thousand nest boxes in a large area and then easily um, survey them and manipulate them. So this is a wonderful experiment where um, I think it's uh, Landine Doliguez um, manipulated the brood sizes of pied flycatchers um, so that the parents were rearing large broods, um, broods that were controlled by having the chicks switched around or not switched around, but no change in the number, um, or um, reducing the number of nestlings per box so that when young of the year were, would be investigating. That, that's what the really clever thing was that once they banded the birds in the area, a number of researchers observed that like, hey, a lot of bird, young birds are just sticking their heads in other birds' nest boxes. They're not like predating, they're not eating them, they're just sticking their heads in. And they're like, hmm, maybe they're trying to see like, if you know, this is a place where successful broods are being reared. So they did this experiment. And interestingly, like when you manipulate the size of the broods, you make the parents work and that can be kind of crappy for them, right? Um, so in, in this figure, you see that if you increase, I is for increase, right? Increase um, the two different controls and then D is for decrease. Um, the number of chicks in the in the nest. When you increase the number of chicks, sure, you increase the number of chicks that are fledged. If you decrease, if you take a few chicks out, then few chick, fewer chicks fledge. But here's the interesting thing. If you increase the number of chicks, they end up all being lighter. If you decrease, they end up being heavier. If you mess with them by doing reciprocal switches, that disturbs them, they get a little lighter. If you don't change the number and you don't mess with them, the chicks are a little heavier. So this body condition um, at of the chicks is like a really interesting measure of like what the manipulation is doing. But that was not the main point of the experiment. The main point of the experiment is how does manipulating the average size of broods in a patch affect the settling behavior of young birds who are sticking their heads in all these nest boxes. This is the cool thing. Plots with increased broods had more immigrants, right? And plots with reduced broods had fewer young birds settling in those plots the next year. So this is really cool, exciting effect. Um, it means that the young birds are making assessments, learning about patch quality, um, and that's affecting their, their settling decisions the next year. Um, and plots with both reduced and enlarged broods have more immigrants. So this is interesting too, because the reduced broods, the chicks are in very good condition, but a lot of them leave. Um, and the enlarged broods, you know, both the parents and the chicks are probably in crappy condition and a lot of them leave. This one's a little bit harder to interpret, but it's also kind of interesting. This experiment is even more mind blowing because it's looking at two different species. And what, they, what um, the researchers did was um, they set up nest boxes in pairs and um, because these birds are fairly territorial, um, they would settle, you know, when one nest box was settled, the other one would be empty. And what the researchers did is they'd switch it up between years, but in one year they would put one symbol like triangles on the occupied nest boxes 
and circles on the unoccupied nest boxes. And then they put out a ton of empty nest boxes with triangles or circles on them the next year. And so they manipulated the symbols on um, gray tits and blue tits. Um, and then they tested the settling behavior of pied flycatchers the next year. And what they found is the pied flycatchers would nest in whatever symbol had been associated with occupied nests in the other species the previous year. So they're training them not just like to settle in a given patch, but to settle in nest boxes marked with a completely arbitrary symbol, triangle or circle, the next year. That's what this figure is show showing. It's like the number of offspring in the tutor nest, the more offspring in the tutor nest, the more likely that um, that uh, the pied flycatchers and the other species would settle in a nest with the same um, shape on the um, on the out on the entrance hole. Totally cool. Okay, um, social eavesdropping is a little bit different than public information use. This is when you're extracting information from the signaling informations between conspecifics. Um, so this is um, individuals are going to make choices depending on the interactions that they observe among others. So this might be they you see a, a contest over a territory and you avoid picking a fight with the winner of that fight of that interaction. You're, you're more likely to pick a fight um, with the loser of that interaction. Um, or there's you observe mate choices of others and you copy those um, mate choices. Um, and that's what we're about to and that's what we're about to look at. Okay. Um, so there's been a lot of work on mate choice copying. Um, and this is so um, we know that um, females often have preferences in and males often have preferences in, you know, the traits of individuals that they're going to be more likely to to mate with. Um, and the under the like usually unstated assumption is that um, female or male pre preferences are under tight genetic control. Um, however, there's a lot of experimental evidence now that um, mate choice can be influenced by um, seeing the, in, the preferences of others. Um, and so we're going to talk mostly about guppies. Um, it's been the main research project of Lee Dugatkin. Um, but um, there have been another other, there have been a number of other um, fish and bird um, examples that have been studied in some depth. So guppies, um, the females are big, um, they're selected for high fecundity, the males are colorful, um, and a lot of these choices, color, tail size, are traits that have been shown to be preferred by some, uh, by, by most females. So um, females preferred uh, males with more orange color. Um, and so you compare male A and male B. Um, however, if an observer or a learner in this figure, female D, sees a less colorful male that is preferred by another female, she's much more likely to mate with that male, um, which was not observed um, being chosen as a mate. Right, so this figure kind of describes the next few slides, but now we'll like put a little data on that. And it's a great system for studying because you know fish, fish tanks, you can kind of control them. Um, you can have in most all of these um, trials, the females in the center, and she'll be presented with a choice of different males. And there's tremendous variety in coloration in guppies, natural variation, and because selective breeding, people have been breeding funny looking fish for, you know, hundreds of years. So the basic experiment is that you present two males to a female, and you then let the female choose, and she chooses by swimming closer to one or the other. Um, and so now you, you let the female say what her naive, in this case, preferences, um, untrained preference. And then 
you take them out and the next day or an hour later, you um, put the female in the center, but this time you have a second female in the same tank as the less preferred male. And the question is now, does that focal female's preference shift? So before she liked the green male, but now she's seeing the multicolored male with a second female. Um, and is she going to then um, imitate the mate choice or the implied mate choice of the female? In fact, this female was given no choice. She was just in that tank, same tank as the male. And in fact, she does. So this um, figure, um, at least for me, you know, you need to kind of you need to kind of work through in um, there, the solid bars um, are expected preferences and um, the um, open bar is the actual um, preference of the female. And so what will also make this maybe make more sense is this is in the um, initial trial and then um, this is in the um, after the training trial. All right. So initially, you put a female in the middle of the tank, in, in the central tank, and there is one male on either side. There's no expected preference. That's why um, the expected preference is that is 50-50. Um, but um, females do, in fact, have a preference, and you pick the one that, um, you know, that um, if you present the, the female um, with um, the same choice of males twice, um, they're much more likely to, they're, they're, they're basically, they're going to have a preference. So their preference is not 50-50, it's you know, in this case, it's like 85, 15. And so if you take the male that um, initially is less preferred, but you stick a female, a second female next to that less preferred um, male, um, the expectation is if females have only a genetic predisposition to prefer one male or another, that the um, there should be no change in preference. So no expectation is no change in preference. But actually, 80% um, of the time, females switch their preference. And this is a nice, you know, repeatable result. It's been replicated a zillion times. Um, there's a lot more questions about this kind of uh, mate choice copying, um, although it does suggest that, um, you know, if you want to be more attractive to members of the same or opposite sex, um, that you um, recruit friends to, um, join you in social situations to make you um, appear more desirable and, um, you know, uh, inspire mate choice copying decisions in, um, in others. Um, so there's a real question about whether, how, you know, how long lasting is this effect? Um, so these trials usually are done sort of, you know, with like half an hour or an hour in between. Um, so, um, but there have been other versions where the time interval um, is lengthened. So um, you, you do the same, you know, two treatments, establish a preference, have a female next to the less preferred, see if there's a switch. And then 24 hours later, you present two similar males to the female, um, similar to the first trial, not similar to each other. Um, and then you ask, is the 
you know, does she revert back to her initial preferred type or to the learned, the one that the um, model female was, was, um, was kept with. And, um, and in fact, the learned preference appears durable. So it doesn't revert back to 50-50 or to, um, you know, 15%. They usually, the next day, they still prefer the male that they've seen a model female with. Cool. Um, so what are the differences between like, um, uh, between uh, public information use, um, you know, social learning, uh, and, uh, um, and um, uh, made choice, um, made choice copying. Um, I've lost the, I've lost the power of speech, sadly. Um, um, sorry, inadvertent social information, that was the third. So um, social learning, um, public information use, and inadvertent um, social information. Um, so in the first case, there might be intentional communication, right? Um, there might even be um, recruitment of foragers, or there might potentially be teaching. In public information use and inadvertent, there's obviously no um, intentional communication, and there's usually no communication at all. Um, so um, that's that's one difference, whether the source of information is like actual um, intentional teaching or at least direct communication. If there's um, overheard communication or if there's no communication and you're just observing the success of others or failure of others and using that to learn. Um, what's similar is that, you know, you need social, you need other individuals. Um, and then the capabilities of the learner are going to be a little bit different. So in inadvertent social information and even like, you know, social learning imitation, um, you, you, all you have to do is imitate the choices of others in, um, in inadvertent, in, um, public information use, there's got to be some counting or quantitative quantifying, you know, you have to be able to measure the success of others, which is a little bit different quantitative assessment. Um, and then one other thing to keep in mind is that like honesty or reliability um, of the signal might be higher in overheard or inadvertent social information or eavesdropping than in direct communication because the interests of the teacher or model and the learner have to be aligned for you know direct um, interactions to lead to useful information but if they don't know that you're watching them then there's they're not going to be lying okay um so this leads to like, you know, sort of fitness costs and benefits of learning. Why is it good to imitate the choices of others? And so we're going to look at a bunch of experiments to try, sort of try to address that. One is it might be costly to learn, like the, the time that it takes, um, the um, danger it might take to investigate um and um, sample new habitats might expose you to predators so learning might be costly um and as an alternative and both of these can be operating um learning might just be hard right it might be hard to count things it might be hard to assess habitat quality but it might be easy to imitate um so there's been a, a lot of modeling to try to figure out you know um, predict when learning from others versus learning for yourself is going to be beneficial. And um, it, you know, it, it, the um, evolutionary ESS side of this is not as important. Um, the important part of this um, framework is just that, um, you know, your, your expected um, 
fitness is going to be the average fitness without um, any um, learning on your own, plus the gain from learning from 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 learning on your own minus the cost of choosing and sampling. And so basically, the the um, choice that Pruitt Jones and then many others were looking at was um, when should individuals sample habitat themselves to learn about its quality versus copying the foraging decisions of others and avoiding any of the time and costs of sampling. Although um, what's important is like um, the quality of information um, declines the more everyone is just copying each other versus learning um, what's actually out there for themselves, right? So that's the ESS part of whether it's beneficial to like try to learn for yourself the quality of a habitat versus scrounging, what's gonna, what we're gonna call scrounging, which is imitating um, the choices of others. So if everyone is imitating everyone else, then there's no good information to be made to be found and um, you're going to gain a lot from um, investigating different patches and habitats yourself. If everyone is, is, trying, is trying hard to search for themselves, information, the behavior of others now becomes a good predictor of whether a hat patch is good or bad and you avoid all the costs of sampling by imitating, right? So that's why there's going to be a like a, a ratio of producers and scroungers. And if everyone's searching for themselves learning, then it's great to be a scrounger, a copier. But if everyone's copying, then the information's terrible and you do much better trying to learn for yourself whether a patch is good. So this has been studied a lot with, um, um, with uh, patch choice in um, especially pigeons and other birds. Um, and the 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 other variable that affects you know the costs and benefits of learning has to do with like how on what time scale does your environment change in other words if the environment doesn't change um it's great to just copy what everyone else is doing um and and there's going to be sort of an intermediate if the best choice never changes then you can copy others but you also like it doesn't you don't even have to learn. You can have just a fixed preference. If the environment changes super rapidly all the time, you don't learn much from others. Um, okay. I'm, I thought, I think what we're going to do now, so we're going to look at a couple experiments. Um, a lot of these questions have been studied with, um, with birds and pigeons are nice because they're sort of easy to study in captivity or semi-captivity. Um, and um, what I want to do is show a couple videos of what, um, um, of what this behavior looks like. So I've already introduced the terms. Um, scroungers copy the behavior of others. Producers um, are those that are actually sampling habitat and learning for themselves whether it's a rewarding habitat and the choice of whether to be a producer or a scrounger um, you know varies with both how consistent the habitat is and especially with how many other what are the behaviors of others okay so um wanna let's go stop sharing file and instead let's share a window and we're going to take a look at um, some producers and scroungers here. So these are pigeons and whoops that's the wrong one. These are pigeons and you can see um, one, there are some birds that are foraging and investigating cups and then there are other birds that just go over to where the other birds are foraging and investigating cups although there's one where it looks like there might have also been like a little 
mating display going on rather than foraging. But you can really see some birds are like going to different cups and sampling and others are foraging. And then there's that male and female in the lower left-hand corner who's just um, following um, the female and is not thinking about food at all. Whoops. Okay. So, so um, the frequency of copying should be greater in species or habitats where the costs of learning um, and investigating for yourself are greater. And so this has not been tested enough. Um, so I'm going to talk about like a fail failed experiment, but it shouldn't be the end of the story. So this was, um, again, with guppies, who are usually great for looking at like copying versus sampling. And basically, they were the um, mate choice trial was done except with, with or without um, a big fish in a nearby tank, a predator. Um, that couldn't actually eat the focal fish, but would have an effect on the perceived danger. And the idea was in a danger, more dangerous habitat, um, you don't have the time to closely investigate every potential male, in this case, every mate. And so um, you should use copying more in a more dangerous environment. Um, And so here we have um, a predator in the tank, um, and we have um, a male with or without a model female. Um, so it's very similar, except with the addition of a predator. And um, the, you know, the experiment one, there is no model female, there's a less preferred male. Um, they don't reverse their choices that often. Experiment two, there's a model female. Uh, now they usually reverse their choices. Um, however, in experiment three, the expectation was that where there's a predator, they should copy more. They should rely less on, on sampling. And actually, it doesn't really, there wasn't an effect of a, of a predator in this situation. Um, and hunger um, had the opposite effect as predicted. So they also did this trial with or without predators, and they also did um, hungry versus well-fed females. The idea is that a hungry female doesn't have as much time to spend staring at all the males and should be using copying and imitation more. Um, but um, in fact, the hungry females didn't change their preference when exposed to the model, but well-fed females did change their preference. So maybe the females were so hungry they couldn't even look at what the um, models were doing. Um, it's, it, it's still an interesting question. And actually, I haven't done a new literature search on this in a few years, so it'd be totally um, worth looking at danger and costs of sampling um, as, a, you know, as a paper topic. Um, because these are all very sort of artificial trials. Um, predator in a tank might be a threat, but it might not be because it's in another tank. Um, and it's not clear that like looking at a male or looking at a female um, is a particularly expensive activity that's a trade-off for feeding for these, for these fish. However, there's really good evidence, even in, you know, artificial situations, that um, uh, copying is a strategy that um, fish are using when the choice actually happens to be hard, right? So the harder it gets to tell the difference between um, two males, the more likely you are to copy a mate choice decision. And this was shown, this has been shown a whole bunch of times. And this is, you know, I'm going to do a guppy experiment, but it's been seen in other contexts as well. Um, so we already said females prefer more orange males. Um, and so what the experimenters can do is vary 
how big the difference in orangeness is. Are they really close to each other in shade or are they really contrasty and super different? And um, so in this experiment, um, the treatment one, experiment one, they're very close to each other in coloration. Two through four is, you know, different percent difference in the size of that orange patch, but the males themselves were the same size. So as much as possible, they're the same, except for the orange, and that orange difference is either really subtle or really clear. So what they found was um, that in, um, was that um, the females did the most copying when the differences were small. So that's treatment one. Um, in treatment one, the um, female, so in all of these trials, sorry, the model was always presented next to the less orange um, male. So interestingly, so the, and the diamonds are control. So it's a hard, choice to make, right? So what does this being close to 50-50 mean? It means that without a model, it's hard for female to choose, right? The preference is close to 50-50. Um, but with a model, there's a big shift. However, um, when there's a huge difference between, um, you know, in group four, when there's a huge difference between the two males, the females females prefer the more orange male and don't um, shift with a model, right? So that's what this little arrow is. There's only a little change in choice. And then in these intermediate trials, the females can totally recognize the difference in um, treatment, you know, so they mostly prefer the more orange male in the controls. Um, and then, um, but if there's a model, they have a big shift, right? So this is really, really kind of cool. If the difference is clear enough, females don't bother copying. If, um, if the difference is, is less great, they, um, they copy. Okay, so some take-homes um, are that we think of the alternatives to choice copying as like a rigid genetically defined rule, but oftentimes it's not. The whole, the best, most important take home of this producer scrounger stuff is that the alternative to um, copying is learning on your own, which could be hard. Um, and um, so um, the relationship between choice copying, which is a sort of short time within generation process and cultural evolution, which might be like the preferences that we're trained to have, um, isn't the same for animals um, and humans. In other words, um, we do a lot of like cultural training of preferences, beliefs, ideas, and um, as you know, we, you can see like mate, Pre made choice preferences that are very different from the sort of choice copying the short term um, influences um, that we see in, you know, in these animal experiments. Um, and then the other sort of take home is another take home is that um, teaching is much less, it's not verbal, it's often not associated with language, and it's just much less prevalent um and intentional in animals than in humans 
um, and we'll see a lot more about that um, in subsequent lectures. Okay, um, it is it is nine thirteen. Um, I'm not sure I can do a great job um, of zipping through human evolution, although this is pretty short. I'm just going to tell you um, some of the take homes and um, strongly encourage you to read chapter 15. And I will go over these slides after the exam next week. Um, but some of the interesting things about making about our being human are one that we are bipedal. We walk on our legs, on our, you know, on two legs. Um, and um, compared to other primates, we have much smaller canines um, versus other primates, large molars, um, although, you know, even compared to um, uh, like gorillas that are um, plant eaters, they still have large canines, which they use as much for display and fighting. Um, we have large brains. We have slow development. It takes us a long time to grow up, a long juvenile period that is needed to grow and mature those large brains. Um, and we also have you know, long post-breeding survival or menopause, which suggests that you know, grandmothering is really important, um, perhaps more important in humans and other animals. Um, and interestingly, we have slow development, but we have a short interbirth interval that might be on the next slide, um, which means that to combine long development time and short time between having babies compared to other primates, that means we have a lot of cooperative um, intergenerational um, child rearing, at least in our um, recent evolutionary um, past, um, and that's probably connected to long post-breeding survival. Um, we have much more um, uh, developed cumulative cultural evolution, and that's what the early chapters in the Henrik book are great at explaining, like all the embedded knowledge that's needed for um, you know, different cultures to survive in different environments get seen when we have like European explorers that are well-funded um, and smart and then die when they're um, in the wrong habitat um, and um, they'll, you know, their settlements some often fail um, unless they learn, um, you know, valuable local um, survival um, tools, social tools, plant breeding, plant processing, detoxifying tools from the people who have evolved culturally in an area and learned culturally over a long time um, the skills necessary to survive, right? Um, and then, um, well, we'll I, I think we'll, we'll, talk about, um, we'll talk about human evolution um, a little bit more, but, um, the the take home of you know human evolution is the sequence is really interesting that um, we were bipedal before we had large brains and we had large brains for a long time um, before we had rapid cultural evolution um, and we um, the other interesting patterns are that um, our toolkits used to um, change on the time scale of hundreds of thousands of years and sometimes millions of years. Um, and now our tools change on a scale of, you know, decades, right? Um, so cultural evolution, we, what it, you know, if you want to like summarize human evolution, it's that there was lengthy, slow genetic evolution to reach a state where cultural evolution, um, you know, dragged us very rapid through many periods of rapid change. Um, and actually cultural evolution led to um, genetic changes as well. So we'll be talking about that a bunch. Okay, I'm gonna stop here. Um, I'll stick around to answer questions. And um, next week we have an exciting midterm and an exciting finishing this lecture in